The first reading is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 29, verses 15 to 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilzah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah, and Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't, do not know how to pray as we are, but that very Spirit intercedes besides too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus who died, yes. Who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of Christ. I pray you, Lord, that your spirit be present in the words spoken and also in the words heard. I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's good to see you all again. I'm beginning to fall back into it. I told them I'm not going to do any more coverage anymore. I'm getting hard to get around. But it seems there's very few priests around, so I guess I'll be doing this until I drop in. Anyway, I have a confession to make. I never was good at theology, and what I learned is long gone from my memory. So I look at sermons online, I cheat, and I write my sermons from other people's research. So here goes. In verse 13 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, it says, then the disciples came and asked him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have more, have more will be given, and they would have abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And harsh. In Matthew 13, there are seven parables. I focused on the parable of the mustard seed in verses 31 and 32. Great oaks from little acorns grow. I'm sure you've heard that saying before. And I'm also pretty sure many, if not all of you, fully understand what it means. From humble, small, insignificant beginnings, great things can grow and materialize in this world. Hence, great oaks, many hundreds of years old, and reaching to the skies, began life like this, an acorn. An acorn which dropped, which dropped from the oak tree and was buried in the ground. It was buried in the ground, hidden and unseen by human eyes, until one day a small shoot sprang up, and over many years 
a tall, strong, majestic oak was grown. A mustard seed is indeed microscopic. Yet when it is fully grown, it grows into a plant that is some four meters in height. How do we grow? How do we grow from our mustard seed faith? How do we give God our attention, especially when our faith is still a seedling that can, hasn't reached the light of day yet? First, we make a choice to walk with God. That means treating him as a friend, a mentor, a coach, a parent. Talk to him often. When I was a single parent, and overwhelmed. I used to go on the balcony after the children had gone to bed and chatted with God and asked him to help me, and he did. Try doing the same. You'd be amazed how just chatting to God works. And then thank him. See his majesty in everyday life, in sunrises and sunsets, and in the stunning wonder of our lakes and oceans. See the beauty that surrounds us and thank him for it. Don't get depressed, we have a wonderful thing. Giving God our daily mindfulness will help us get to know him and your seedling will start reaching up to the sun. Let's listen to God. God normally speaks very quietly and sometimes gives us a gentle nudge. In fact, it was his nudge that led me into this ministry. I sort of felt called, but I was running. Um, I grew up in a clergy home and I saw what my father went through and I did not want to do that. So I decided to go on a pilgrimage to find out. The pilgrimage was to go to Iona. Do people know where Iona is? It's, it's on the west coast of Scotland, just the other side of Mull. It's a very sacred place. I where it was now. Oh yes. Um, I decided to go, so I went you take a plane to Edinburgh, then a train to Oban, then a boat to Iona. So it's quite a way to go. And I sat. I went every day and I sat on this rock. And I saw, I prayed, Lord, give me something to tell me if I should go this way. Well, I went every day, but nothing happened. But, don't give up. I was on my way back to where I was staying, and a whole flock of sheep followed me over this bridge into the next field. I just laughed. That surely was the message. Feed my sheep. Then I went south and I stopped at um, a cousin's in York. And not far from that is Hampswaite, where my father was thicker. So I said, while I'm here, maybe I should go and see Hampswaite. He said, you spoiled my surprise. And he had already arranged to take me to Hampswaite. He had keys to get into the church. and. Then we walk, walked in, I don't know whether anybody's been to church, to churches in England, but in England the church entrance, except for the main entrance, is through the vestry. And we walked into the vestry and there in front of me was a photograph of my father. Now my father died quite young and I felt that this also was a message. Yes, God will nudge you, no matter how you want to run. It can be hard to discern God's messages, but one thing is certain, you have to listen closely. Pay attention 
and he will make you. Make himself known to you. Study and learn. Read the Bible. Go to Bible study. Read books by notable Christians. Learn about Christianity and its history. People think that having faith is only about hope. But there is a logical foundation for Christianity. That's based on mere fact, since it cannot be proved conclusively by scientists. Actually, the best books are those in which non-Christians set out to disprove Christianity and end up concluding that there is no other possibility than Christianity. Even if you have great faith, you will find comfort and satisfaction in their stories. In fact, proving our belief is impossible because it is about faith. I was once asked if I knew God, and I said no, and they were surprised. So I went on to say, if I knew God, I'd be God. It's not about knowing, it's about believing. So keep your mustard seed faith growing. Nurture your mustard seed faith and the reward would be great, as Jesus promised. Before you know, know it, your tiny mustard seed would have flourished into a big, beautiful bush, giving you a glimpse of the majesty and beauty that awaits for all eternity. But don't forget that every plant needs continual nourishment or it will eventually fade away. Keep your mustard seed faith strong with regular care and it will continue to grow even bigger and stronger than you could have imagined. I hope this parable of the mustard seed helped to bring a fresh perspective to this powerful parable and helps you nurture your mustard seed faith for the rest of your days. Amen.